tēnā koutou, a koutou katoa, e wakoa tēnei hui, a tēnei te mihi aku ki a koutou. Ki ka kai mahi, a kai te mihi aku, mō te kaupapa o te rā, te mihi ono ki a te ati awa, te mana tēnei wa te whanga nui a tāra, a tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. I should say in opening that uh, my fame as a uh, grower of uh, the sort of antipodean Johnny Appleseed thing about me growing for Hutakawas is actually to do with the fact that Wendling of Dennis's husband's mooring is a particularly good one. And it's very secure, and when they're not there, uh, it's nice to be able to sneak onto it. Uh, and, uh, uh, I'm not that virtuous. Anyhow, Maxon's been pruning them, and there's less room for the two. So, but my enough of that. My, my um, purpose this morning first was to uh, make the point, following what some of the things that Honourable uh, Jim McClay's been speaking to you about. First, to talk about um, the frog test. Um, the, the, much of this discussion about a constitution uh, is, comes down to whether or not we want a single written document uh, interpreted uh, by courts, uh, which are made up of promoted lawyers, um, uh, and on the basis of submissions advanced by people who ultimately want to be judges, and a whole process of uh, uh, formal structure and control um, of the overarching principles that run us uh, uh, by, by that process, um, or whether or not we want to follow this gradual accumulation of convention which has been so brilliantly described to us here this morning. This accumulation of bits and pieces of law and principles and issues, and some of them entrenched and some of them not. And, uh, a belief that you know enough people to do the right thing in the right situation. And, hey, it's not such a bad model. Let me come to the frog. You, you, I, I'm, I haven't actually done this, but I've got good authority, uh, including the internet, for uh, telling me uh, that uh, it's true. But if you drop a frog into a pot of hot water, it immediately jumps out at you. Yet if you put a frog into a pot of relatively uh, uh, lukewarm or cold water uh, and then you start to progressively heat it over time, you end up with boiled frog. Um, that it doesn't jump out, it just dies. Now that idea, you can apply across a number of species, but it's the general principle of it that, uh, the general principle of it that I just want to bring to your attention that one of the reasons that you go on muddling on, and we just muddle along and do things incrementally over time, is that we get to a certain uh, point um, uh, where, uh, which is almost completely unsatisfactory, uh, but we've just, because we've arrived there, we've actually done nothing, we've just adjusted to the weather as we've gone through and done whatever had to be done, and we end up with unsatisfactory and suboptimal outcomes. That notion has to be set against the notion that you can actually design, impose, and follow a clear set of rules which will be vastly superior and satisfactory. I'm reminded of Matthew Palmer's, Professor Matthew Palmer's uh, essay on the culture of constitutions that he points out that uh, some of the finest provision for indigenous people, which has been one of my great concerns, um, uh, are to be found uh, in the uh, uh, constitution of the Republic of China and indeed in the Republic of North Korea. Uh, and neither of which are shining examples of virtue. The uh, most horrible bastardry was performed on the North American Indians under the guise of the American Constitution, despite the martial judgments of 10 years, 11 years prior to the Treaty of Waitangi. 
and yet the American Constitution permitted all that to happen, and you might say that now North American Indian communities have certain um, uh, protections guaranteed by the American Constitution. Go back and look what's been done in that Constitution's name. Ask the good people of the Philippines how they feel about what's been done in the name of that mobile constitution. You know, uh, you can keep on doing this. So Matthew Palmer's thesis that the culture of constitutions is far more important than the word or the letter of the constitution is one of the critical considerations that you have to have. Now, I have for years stood up on an annual basis on February the 6th and delivered stimulating and absolutely riveting addresses to the assembled populace that they've been, well, the assembled populace, um, on the basis of the absolute necessity for a uh, written entrenchment of the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi in a New Zealand written constitution. I have now reached an age, that's that point where getting up in the morning is not so much a matter of showering and dressing but of reassembly, that when you get to that point, what you do, you start thinking about some of these things, and I'm by no means as certain of a lot of things that I was when I was younger, and I'm by no means convinced, whilst I think our arrangements clearly require some ordering and tidying, I'm by no means convinced that um, I was right and Matthew Palmer was wrong. Uh, and I'm much more focused on the culture of the Constitution, I think, than I uh, was previously. And I'm very interested in to, to see what the present process in which I'm involved, which is the uh, essentially the first phase of a review process is going to do to um, shift my views uh, even further. But it is because on the Constitutional Advisory Panel, which together with Professor Burroughs will speak to you this evening, uh, I'm a co-chair, we are engaged in the business of initiating and getting underway a process which is to advise the responsible ministers what New Zealanders want to talk about in this context. So in other words, we've got to find out what people want to have a conversation about when they, as yet, they don't know they want to have a conversation, which is something of a challenge. Now, um, people don't normally get up in the morning and finish their cereal and yoghurt and say, what am I going to do about habeas corpus? What am I going to do about the treaty? What am I going to do uh, about the cabinet manual revision? It, it's not the ordinary stuff of ordinary people's lives. And so one of our challenges is to find those things which will engage most people. We're not short of academics and lawyers and all sorts of highly skilled people wanting to advise us as to what should happen, but getting ordinary New Zealanders going about their ordinary lives to say, how do they want New Zealand to be in these terms? What are the values they want to see manifested in their world and in their society? It's quite a challenge. Because the other thing we know, and we've got to consider, is that that society is going to be very, very different. I've got a great granddaughter. She was born about five weeks ago, six weeks ago. Uh, when she's 38, we'll be at the half century. I've got five children older than that. Right? And at the half century, have a look for yourselves at what the shape of the population is going to be what the ethnic mix, up, mix of it is going to be, what the age differences and differentials are going to be, where people are going to be living, what we're going to be earning, who we're going to, you know, imagine all the demographic and other stuff you can 
We can reasonably rely on as to what New Zealand will be like in shape as a society at, 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 at 2050. It's, well, you know, logically, it's going to be enormously different anyhow. But look at the makeup of it. It's going to be like something you have not thus far experienced. Yet most of the rules we govern ourselves have been rules that my dad, my grandfather, my great-grandparents would have recognised. The conventions of this place next door have barely changed since my grandfather was there in the balanced government which preceded Richard John Sen. You know, will they still really work? How functional are they? I listened to Jim McClay talking about the nature of democracy. We all want democracy. Great stuff, democracy. Most democratic election in history was the one that elected Adolf Hitler. So what do we mean? Democratic is a very good adjective, but democracy is a very, very difficult noun, I promise you. And how do we want these things to be? How do I want that future to be for my great granddaughter? I'm only talking again as far as the half century, because the figures get more interesting and challenging as you get a bit beyond that, but less <coughs> perhaps usefully predictive. Now, we've got to get a conversation going about these things. We've got to talk about separate Maori representation, various dimensions of the length of parliament, various things to do with uh, uh, the electoral process. There's a whole string of things that we've got. Well, Richard Burries will deal with you, deal with a lot of those with you this evening. But I am primarily concerned about how we get people to think about how they want Aotearoa New Zealand to be. Given my own life, there is a major role in my thinking for the future of the treaty in a post-treaty settlements world and what that really means. And when I hear parliamentary separate representation of parliament discussed for Maori representation, I'm always told, I'm told about how the, about this undemocratic <coughs> nature. I used to be desperately opposed to it because I thought it was non-functional. I wasn't interested in the ideology because I know how it came about. It was essentially a device to prevent Māori having democratic capacity in the society. It was invented specifically for that. It was a part of the ideological racism of which the existing arrangements of this country were deliberately founded. Go to the history. Read Superintendent Cargill, read Gray, Read the remarkable instructions of Normandy to Hobson and see what Hobson was told to do. He didn't make a bad fist of it. Before you start saying that those essential concepts were bad or wrong, look at the essential ideological racism of the foundations of the New Zealand state. See how the New Zealand state capitalised itself by decapitalising Māori. And then you start to understand that much of what we have today is the accumulated process of gradual bits and pieces repair of a very flawed beginning. Well, flawed certainly from the 1860s on. Now, I'm not here to give you a sermon on New Zealand history, but just remember when I hear the story that my very much respected friend Jim McClay was just saying to you, if it ain't fixed, don't broke it. Uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I would have to say that uh, there are a lot of people who genuinely believe that the fundamental ideological underpinnings of New Zealand out there that are, have not yet changed. And so, uh, and I still see the trace elements of that in what I'm looking at. So, I can only finish by talking about on the 
uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, in an earlier session, which uh, my friend uh, Peter Dunn will recall, in the Legislative Council Chambers discussing the Constitution some years ago, the Professor Bill Oliver, the historian, stood. He said one of the most curious things about the character of New Zealand identity is that Kiwis or New Zealanders, having planted the tree of identity in this remote and distant place, come along every 10 years and dig it up to see how the roots are getting on. And that's pretty much one of our practices and habits, which we do have to think about. So we do need some enduring, agreed consensus, and we do need to settle it. I have to say, it is not yet settled. But whether we need it in one document or in an accumulation of interesting things in some constitutional tabernacle, I leave to your deliberations. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā rakata. Nova, um, just in relation to, um, I suppose, your comments about the um, Māori sex in 1967 and how that wasn't was incompatible, I suppose, with Māori interests. Uh, um, sorry, is because of democracy is inherently incompatible with Māori interests in um, tikanga. Do you have faith that we can form a constitution within a democratic constitutional body that that can incorporate the interests of Māori in a more um, as a core focus as opposed to something that has become external. Well, I, I'm a bit cagey about the sanctification of tikanga and turning it into some uh, new block of ethnic holy writ. And why do I say that? Because I've seen too much. I, tikanga just means nga tika those things which are correct. It's proper or correct custom. Uh, the, so, but one of the dangers is these things get into law, judges, lawyers get hold of them, judges get hold of them, and I spent some time on the plane this morning flying north uh, with a very senior treasury officer, um, who's had some association with treaty settlements and issues in the past. And we we're just talking about the way in which we've now got, you can't mix the water from two catchments all because of a decision of Chilwell in Natiapa, no, in uh, Natiapa, in, uh, and it's a whole new tea which I'm hearing all over the place, despite the fact that there's loads of evidence in Māori history where Māori have actively mixed the waters of different catchments. But now, because of the Resource Management Act and General Precedent, it's all through the place and it's now all tikanga. I watched the, der the evolution of the term and the status of wahitapu in the law uh, surge through um, as a consequence of a casual conversation in a negotiation in the Forestry Settlements Act between Sir Graham Latham and Geoffrey Palmer and suddenly we had this whole new concept. I watched the invention by a select committee of the concept of the Taya Puda. All of these things are now solemnly pronounced as tikanga. And um, I'm pretty cynical of it because I see it being manufactured on the hoof by lawyers, Māori leaders and others as we go. And we spend more time in the Waitangi Tribunal and other such places trying to get ordinary Māori community competent in Te Reo to understand what the hell a taia puta is, or a mataitai and so on, because these are inventions to solve problems, and they've been blessed with the name of tikanga. So I'm cautious about that. I am much, much more pragmatic. My past opposition to Māori separate representation was 
based on the way in which, when the four Māori members of parliament held the balance of power in the Nash government, which had a majority of one in total, in 1959, and we had the no Māoris, no tour argument, the four Māori members went with the Labour Party. And that earned them, as far as I was concerned, my contempt for what was a shocking thing, which we were ultimately bailed out of by um, Holyoke and Marshall, I think largely on the initiative of Marshall. Now, uh, but I've changed, I've shifted my ground to some extent about those Māori seats. Now, my reason has been that we do need, in this curious thing we're evolving, some focus for Māori political cohesion around those issues which are fundamentally Māori and which are not yet resolved. And when I was putting the, co the, the panel a proposition to some of my own people, a couple, two or three women, somewhat older than me, but still feeling they had the capacity, uh, younger than me, I'm sorry, but feeling they had the capacity to call me boy, called me over to them uh, during the coffee break and said, does this mean we're going to, once we're finally going to get Māori control of Māori things and all our world is not going to be run by Pākehās? And she was talking about Mahi Kai Tikanga. Uh, she was talking about their lands, their rights, and a whole range of things like that. And I said, well, I, I would hope so. She said, well, that's a good job you're doing then, boy. And that's about the limit of her comprehension, and I don't think it would have been much better across at the uh, Wollstone Bowling Club. So, Māori representation, we do need something in there which is specifically going to represent Māori rather than macro parties, represent iwi rather than parties. And to the extent that the present situation does that, I tend to be supportive of it. It's a uncharacteristically extensive answer. <laughs>